My guest today is David Boyce. David, thank you so much for being on here with me today. I appreciate it. Good morning, and you're welcome. I hear some roosters in the background. I heard a garden hose going off while ago, so I know you're outside. For It must be a great day where you are. It is. It's beautiful. It's right about 55, 60 degrees right now. The sun's shining, not a cloud in the sky. Hey, I heard, I saw something the other day about roosters chasing people. You ever had one chase you? (laughs) Only once. Okay, okay, good. I saw something, some nonsense on Facebook. You know how you just look on Facebook, there's not much there. But but anyway, I wanted to ask, um, you you have a very unique story, man. And I, we've had the opportunity to talk before, and I've been anxiously awaiting the chance to speak with you again. So I'm going to get right to what made it unique, and then I'll ask you a few questions here. And um, so, David, you were incarcerated for over 20 years for a crime that you did not commit. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, you know, I was thinking about you this morning. You know, we get in situations, well, I get in situations where, like, for example, we wish things were different, different decisions we made or, or things. We, everybody gets into that. And then I think about you, sir, and I go, how how do you make it over 20 years in there every day knowing that you did not do it? How did how did you get through that, David? Well, I, you know, for the first half of that, I did not do very well at all. I um, it seemed a very hopeless situation for me. Every appeal that we ever filed ended up getting turned down. And basically, they told me I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison and die there. That's uh, so right now, you know, it's talking to you even now. It's just a miracle to be able to do that. So, you know, that that had a great deal to play on my mind. And, you know, I did not do that well my first half of, the, of prison. And and I don't know if you've ever heard of Cairo's prison ministry, but I was invited to go to a Cairo's weekend, and it was not an immediate change, but everything everything changed from there, though. Not my circumstances mm-hmm. or my situation, but just how God started to work in my heart, which allowed me to be able to see how he was still working in my life, even if my life, like you said, was not what I wanted it to be, and it didn't seem like it was ever going to be the way I wanted it to be but as he began to to just kind of work on my heart and soften that up I had the ability to be able to see the opportunities that were with me right then and there Mm -hmm. and not think so much about the future of what I wanted but just what I could do right then and you know that that really was a game changer for me and it changed the way I saw my circumstances a little bit, not to the point where I was happy about being where I was, and I was still was very very sad, and you know I went through bouts of depression and things like that. But at the same time, you know, God was able to just carry me through and, and gave me purpose while I was there. And I kind of think that's what we all kind of search for in our lives is to have some type of purpose, to know that this all isn't just for nothing and and even in those circumstances, God gave me the uh, the sight to see that and the ability to do the things he wanted me to do. See, that was the reason I started that way. That's a level of despair, man, that's hard for me to get my head around. And I think about you often. You know, when I'm when I'm thinking about, oh, this and that, I go, wait a minute here. That right there is a level of despair. It's hard to get my head around. So in that, you found... Your purpose. What what was that? What did what did the Lord tell you that you were meant to do? Well, it wasn't so much that, you know, he had told me what I was meant to do, but it was it was that he presented me with opportunities because I, I was you know, I was very afraid to be able to for public speaking and you know, in prison you mind your business and things like that. But, you know, as I started getting involved in the church and church started getting involved in me I started to change how I seen things. And then God would just give me opportunities where, you know, guys would come up to me and I'm sitting here with two life sentences, never going to get out of prison. 
and they're telling me how hard it is, you know, that they're going to be away from home for five years or 10 years or something like that. But, but, you know, I was able to see their sadness and, you know, just be able to just give them somebody to listen to them. Cause you know, I mean, when we're feeling bad, we want somebody to hear us, just not listen to what we say, but actually hear us. So, you know, my circumstances allowed me to be able to hear people maybe a little better than people who didn't go through my circumstance. Uh huh. But it was yeah. but it was a wonderful opportunity for me because in all of that, you know, God was just continuously just working in me and preparing me and doing things. And it got to a point where, you know, I was just like, God, I don't know if I'm ever going to get out of here. Just help me be the best person I can while I'm here. And, you know, probably 90% of the time I failed in that endeavor. But, you know, it, it, I still tried and God still gave me opportunities. And my circumstances didn't change, but God was able to change me within those circumstances. He uh-huh. gave me purpose. I, I was able to be a listening ear and heart for people who may not have had anybody. Um, and in the process, <clears throat> in the process of all that, I, I was I was able to work in the chaplain's office, which was just such a privilege to be able to do. And I, I was able to be involved in the baptism of over forty men oh, that were wow. in prison. And the, these these were just unique experiences that you know just it gave me something to look forward to yeah in a place yeah. where everything is the same day in day out seven days a week it gave me something to look forward to what what do you have for me to do today and just help me not screw it up oh wow that that's pretty profound what is it you want me to do today and help me not to screw it up man that's you might, I might be saying that every morning. <laughs> it might be a change in my habit. <laughs> That's, um, you know, I have notes from our last conversation, by the way. And uh, um, you said that was like a real hardened uh, criminal in there. And, and you described an experience. You said even the most hardened criminals that put on that surface that underneath you saw something that was common. Do you remember yeah, that? Um, me that? I, I do. So I, I had this very young friend, and I, I won't go into the details of what gang he was in or anything like that, but he, he was in a very prominent gang, and for whatever reasons, he and I, we just hit it off. And, and this guy really, he really was, um, you know, he was notorious for stabbing. That was kind of his job, kind of to enforce mm. things. And Somehow or another, you know, we we came together and we just started talking and we hit it off. And he seen a tattoo I had, and from the very beginning, he said, "Hey Harley, how you doing?" And and then it was, what what did he call me after that? It was uh, uh, Lobo Blanco. He would call me White hmm. Wolf, which hmm. that was just something that he used with me. But but yeah, I mean, he was just hurting, you know. He he was going to be in for a while and he uh, was looking to be deported after he was released. He, he had children who he missed dearly. I mean, he understood he was in his circumstances because of his own actions, but that doesn't make the loneliness go away. That, you know, his family's mm-hmm. all the way across the country and just being able to accept your fault in circumstances doesn't mean the loneliness goes away or the heartache or the depression or anything like that. And there would be times that that this, this this young man would just open up to me and have tears in his eyes for the mm. amount of loneliness he felt, which was one of the reasons why he was in a gang in the first place, because he needed to belong to something. He mm. needed to be a part of something that accepted him the way he was, and it gave him purpose, though his purpose was violent. It still gave him a place in something that accepted him. And, you know, I accepted him as he was, and I I really grew to love this young man as if he was my own son. And we would spend hours 
just talking. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, he was just like me. He was in a place he didn't want to be. He was lonely, away from his family. And, you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, we all... You, you hear, you know, if you do the if you do the crime, you got to do the time, and, and I don't disagree with that. But when you are separated from family and friends and all the things that you hold so dear to you, whether it was your own actions that caused that to happen or not, the feelings of that separation are still real. You know, mm-hmm. you you mm-hmm. still miss your children. You still miss not being able to see your mother. And a lot of people may not really think that that's a big deal, but it, but it really is. So everybody in there is really in the same boat. We're all this lonely, but, you know, we're all trying to act tough. And, and of course, that pushes everybody away, which is really odd that we want people to recognize us, but we put on this mask and this attitude that pushes everybody away, and then that just makes us feel worse. So then we get mad about that, and then... There's all kinds of things that happen, but, but yeah, and I, and I experienced several, several individuals inside that were, that I was able, again, just to be able to just hear them out and recognize them for who they were. And God just gave me those opportunities. And, and that was just real, a real eye opener for me as far as, you know, being able to delve into who I am and some of the causes of my own loneliness and depression and things like that. Yeah, I wrote down last time. I warned you. I take notes when you talk to me, man. Well, that's <laughs> so all right. You said everyone just wants to be seen, and what I was thinking yes. about as you were talking, everyone wants to really be seen, not for the mask they're putting on, but really be seen, don't they? Everyone craves yes, and, to be. And you know, seen. on the inside, it's very, well out here too. But on the inside, it's very difficult to trust people because you never know what their motives are going to be or what their agenda is. So being able to find somebody that you can just reveal yourself to and really be seen is a pretty incredible thing. And, you know, I, I, and I'm thankful God gave me that opportunity to be that person for who needed it at the time. Yeah, so, David, when you got out, so when you, when you finally walked out, what was that feeling like when you were, Man, you were free. Oh, it was, it was surreal. Um, uh, just, just a little side note that would lead up to this is I met my wife while I was in prison. Um, we ended up getting married in 2006. So this will be our 17th year anniversary this August. Wow. And, you know, she's just an incredible woman, warrior for God. And she mm. married me believing in who I was. She saw who I was. And, wow. you know, she, she believed in me and in my innocence. And she stayed by my side. And she married me in 2006, knowing that I had two life sentences and may never, ever, ever get out of prison. And she married me anyhow. And wow. so it was really weird. So on the day I was going to be released, they, uh, they had me handcuffed. And they took me into this room, where, and my lawyer was there. And they, they, they took the chains off and the handcuffs and the shackles. And I was talking to my lawyer while they were doing this. And then all of a sudden, it was just me and my attorney in this room. I've, I've never been with anybody that I wasn't supervised in some way. And that was, that was kind of weird for me. And yeah. so we're in there, and... I signed, some more people came in, I signed some paperwork, and I had to use, use the restroom. So I go out into the restroom. I didn't know that I was done. I didn't know that the exit process was over. So I go out into the restroom, and then I walk out, and there, and I get goosebumps now, I'm even still thinking about it. <laughs> there, there are my two attorneys, and my wife, and my wife's son, and they're just standing there in front of me, and I'm in this hallway, and I was like, how did you guys get in here? And all of a sudden, I realized, I, it dawned on me, hey, it's over. And, oh. we, and we stepped out of that building. And, you know, it, it was, you know, I can't really explain the emotion that was going on inside me. Because, one, I was just absolutely elated. And, two, 
I'm scared to death. It's been 23 years. And mm. I step out, and all of a sudden, I'm a free man. Mm. And so my wife's son, we get in the car, and my wife's son is driving us back here to Richmond. And my wife hands me her phone and says, call your mother. And I'm looking at this thing. I've never used a cell phone in my life. And I'm looking at this thing, and I don't know how even to turn it on. So I handed uh -huh. it back to her, and she had to, you know, activate the phone and, and dial the number for me so that I could just tell my mother that I was released. Uh. You know, the one thing I've learned, though, about being in prison, if you're in there long enough, you get transferred from prison to prison a lot. Uh -huh. And you have to be able to develop the ability to just – hit the ground running because you can have a good job and visits and everything going well for you at one prison and a good cell cellmate. Then all of a sudden they just pluck you up and they plant you at another prison. And now you don't have no job. You don't know who your cellmate's going to be. You don't know if you're going to get along. You don't know most of the people that are there. So you have to be able to have the ability to be able to adjust on the fly <clears throat> and keep on going and then overcome. So that was very beneficial for me. When I came home, of course, I didn't have the pressures of not knowing who my cell partner was going to be because yeah. I was coming home with yeah. my wife, and you know, it wasn't a it wasn't a prison rec yard that I was walking around in the next morning. It was my own backyard, so yeah. that was, um, you know, my very first morning. I I get up between four and five every morning, even now, you know, ten years after being out, and. My very first morning, I make a cup of coffee, and I'm sitting in a chair in the backyard, and I'm watching the sun come up and squirrels play. And that really was the moment that uh, I realized that that part of my life was done. Now, there was a whole lot of other stuff that came after that legally, but but that part of my life, being in prison, that that's that's when it really hit me that, you know, I'm out. So that, that, now, what are you up to these days? Do you get it? Well, I got a lot of, two questions. There are a lot of people get out, and then they have trouble getting adjusted. In some, but you are looking for. You got some pretty cool stuff going on. What you working on, David? Well, I, I was, you know, like I said, when I was inside, I tried. I, I just tried to make myself useful, and uh -huh. and as hopeless as it seemed that I would ever get out of prison, I wanted to be as prepared as possible before I did. So mm -hmm. inside, I worked as an electrician, and I worked as an electrician for over 20 years inside, working at the different prisons that I was housed at. And before I was released, about six months before I was released from prison, I was actually able to sit down and take my Virginia Master Electrician's exam, mm -hmm. and I passed. Mm -hmm. And when I came out of prison, I actually had a state master's license electric electrical license when i got mm. out of prison so that really was beneficial so that when i got out i i had the skills and and the knowledge to be able to go into a pretty decent job and i started working for a for a small electrical company after i was released and then eight months after eight months after working for them i had the opportunity to become the lead electrician at one of the local financial uh, incorporations, which really just changed my life because I, I went from making seventy dollars a month to making a heck of a lot more. Yeah. And uh, so that that really did help me to be able to start being able to live a life and, and get back on my feet. But you know, many years before I was released, and it wasn't like I just heard this audible voice, but I just heard it within my heart that, and God had told me that I was going to start an electrical company and he gave me the name of it, what he wanted me to call it. I believe what he wanted me to call it and what the purpose mm -hmm. of it was going to be. And the purpose of it was to be able to give people opportunities when they get out of prison mm -hmm. to get back on their feet. And mm -hmm. so about two years after I was released, um, I, re I felt impressed that we had to get this thing started. And I resigned from a very, very well-paying job. And we had nothing. We had no customers. It was, it was almost as scary as getting out of prison. We, uh, yeah. we had no customers. 
I had no idea how to run a business, but uh, I had a truck and a tool bag, and uh-huh. just faith that God was going to God, God was going to keep his be true to his word, and he was. And we named our company FHG Electric, which stood for For His Glory, which is oh, a great wow. conversation starter when I go to customers' homes because uh-huh. I'll introduce myself as Dave, and they're like, "Well, what's the FHG stand for?" That's not your initials, and I'll be like. Let me tell you. So I get these opportunities to be able to witness in people's homes that I wouldn't otherwise be able to get. But we we ran all the way up until COVID. And um, we at the end of the day, in those few years that we were active, and I think it was right around six or, six or seven years before mm-hmm. COVID, that we had employed 18 people. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Most of them were formerly incarcerated people. Some of them were people who were right out of a tech school and didn't have the experience that other companies wanted in order to hire them. And one guy was actually living in a shelter, um, Mm. which was an awesome opportunity for us. And I was really glad we were able to give it. And he didn't work for us for too many months before he was able to get out of the shelter, get back into a home. And then he went on and got a job where he could make more money at a larger place. How about so yeah, that, that was uh, that was some really cool stuff that we we got to be able to do, and you know now my wife and I we go back into prisons with Cairo's Prison Ministry, and we I try and I hope to be able to give a little bit of inspiration and hope to these men so that they know that the world's not against them and that people love them and that God loves them most of all. So we do that. We do prison ministry, like I said, because of COVID, we pretty much just shut the company down. And I've recently just completely retired from the company, and it is officially done just a couple weeks ago. And now I work part-time for uh, one of the Habitat for Humanity affiliates here in my area, which, again, gives me this really great purpose to be involved in helping build homes for for people who otherwise would not be able to afford one. And we don't give them a home. We build a home. They get a mortgage. But, you know, it's being a part of something bigger than myself and hopefully being able to give back for all that God, (laughs) the incredible abundance that God has done for me in my life. David, I don't know how I I can ask any more questions on that. That FHG is a perfect name in your company. Um, but I do want to, I do, you kind of referenced it, but I do want to ask you this one, okay? We are hoping, that there's there's two audiences here. We're hoping that this message gets into the prison systems, and it's obviously going to get in, it's already outside the prison systems. So can you, almost in summary, that if those listening that are in, that are in prison, please know this. What word of advice would you give them? Your circumstances do not dictate your success. You Mm. can be in prison and still be a successful human being. It's not our geography. It's not the clothes we wear. And you and I talked about what it really is to be successful. And it's not about money and things. And all those are great. But really being successful is being able to have joy and peace and be useful to other people. I, I believe that with all my heart. I, I explained to you before how I had met a homeless man downtown in Richmond who just humbled me because he had more joy not knowing where he was going to lay his head that night than I did that day because I was just complaining that it was hot and I had to go do another job. And here's this guy who doesn't even know where, what his next meal is going to be or where he's going to sleep that night. And he had more joy coming out of him than I could imagine. And it just humbled me. So, you know, our circumstances and our past does not dictate who we are. It does not dictate who we can be. And it doesn't prevent us from being useful and successful in life. Because I I know many people inside who really do just have that real authentic joy and sincere peace. And none of that yeah. comes from being being able to get out or have have things. 
It comes from having Christ in their hearts. And again, even now, I've got a pretty good life. And I think in some moments I had more peace when I had nothing than mm. when I than I do now. But if I was going to tell anybody, and it's the same thing I tell people now when I go back in, that you are valuable. God yeah. made you. So you are valuable. It's just that simple. And, and for no other reason except that God made you, you are valuable. Now, what are you going to do with that value? Do you embrace that value and live within that value? Or do you just give that value away to others for things that really don't matter? And so, yeah, it, it's, it's not over. You can be successful even if you're incarcerated and having Christ in your life may not change your circumstances, but it will help you change how you look at them. You know, David, I, the second part of that question, I think you answered. I think what you just shared applies to everybody, doesn't it? It does. Whether they're incarcerated or not incarcerated, you just you just spoke to every single every person listening to this. I know you did. To um, me. My wife and I are involved in the whole innocence community, and you know, since 1986, there's been over 2,000 people who have been freed from wrongful incarceration. Mm -hmm. And and I know mm -hmm. several of them. And some of these guys have got these really huge settlement checks. You know, they've they've settled for 15 and 20 million dollar lawsuits. So they went from being in prison have absolutely nothing to having 20 million dollars at their disposal and they're more unhappy now than when they were inside. Uh, they um, yeah. they they have bought everything they can buy it still hasn't filled that void in their heart they can't trust anybody because they never know if somebody's there for their money or just for them mm -hmm. and you know they're lonely they've got tons of people around them 24 7 but they're lonely and you know they they fall into depression and alcohol abuse and drug addictions and some of them have committed suicide and you mm -hmm. have to wonder how can somebody with all that money and all that stuff still kill themselves? It's because that stuff's not important. Yeah. Really, what's important is can we have joy and success in our lives just being who we are with what we have and doing the very best of it? And a lot David. of people don't. David, this has been perfect, man. Uh, I was had high hopes for our call. I was looking forward to it for weeks now and then you you just um you gave us all a very powerful message so i'm very grateful david that you're on here with me thank you well no it's been my it's been my honor and privilege jd it truly has i i love to be able to tell people about the success of god in my life because it really isn't our successes when god's doing <laughs> when god's behind it you know we 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 get to partner with God to do the things that we're unable to do on our own. And that's a pretty incredible thing to be able to do in our lives. And, you know, like, like I was telling you before, there's days where I still bellyache and moan. And I was like, well, I wish I had this or I wish I had that or I wish things were different for my life right now. But I can look back where I was 20 years ago and I know that – it is well. You know what mm. I mean? It's um, yeah, it's, a, well, it's yes, been sir. worse, and one day it could even be better. But for right now, it just is what it is, and I and I have to do the best I can with what I have and, w and with God's help to do so. So that's kind of where I'm at now, and I, I hope somebody can take something from that. Um, I'm by no means some poster child for <laughs> – for a successful life, but I, I do serve a successful God who ends up making up for all my shortcomings. You know, David, when you write a book one day or someone asks you to write a book or you do a blog or whatever it is, please reach out to me because we'll have you back on here again. We'll promote that. He's got a, you got a very powerful story. Well, I hope and, you and uh, I will still stay in contact past this. Uh, 
I'd oh, very yes, much be sir. interested in that. And if there's yes, anything sir. else that I can help you with, let me know. Okay. Thanks so much, David. All right. Thank you, J.D. God bless you, buddy. You have a great rest of your day. Okay. You too. Thank you.